There we go. I have found the secret button that should turn you all on. There we are. It doesn't look like anybody's capable of showing video. Well, I'm promoting everybody to a panelist, which should allow them to come through. Um, well, that's in progress, but I can't start my video. Yeah, I know, Steph. Um, do you have any suggestions, anyone who's more maybe familiar than I am? I've, I've made everybody a panelist because this was a webinar, so everyone should be live. And um, just let me cut down the view and put it down to exiting the full screen and see if I can um, set Pat, up more it, control. Yes. Pat, John Sawyer. They yep. say there's, there's a note when you click, when I click on the video, it says you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. I know. So I'm trying to see where I stopped you all from being on the video. <laughs> I'm recording at the moment and I apologize. Um, I thought we were all set. So I walked away. So I'm looking at um, my initial registration to see if I can get myself. We, back can to just, the... we can just look at you through the thing. <laughs> I'm going to turn me off in a second. Why don't you begin the meeting, uh, Mr. Chair, and I'll work with this. Um, Would you like to read that uh, participation meeting notice? Sure. Get that. Yeah. And are we live on YouTube and whatnot? I believe we're live. Yes, we have gone live. Great. So, uh, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Law 30A, subsection 18, and the governor's March 15th, 2020 order imposing a limitation on the number of people they may gather in one location. This meeting will be conducted via remote participation. Specific information such as instructions and guidelines for remote by members of the public and or parties with a right and or requirement to attend this meeting can be found on the town website at www.yarmouth.ma.us. Um, there is no public portion of this meeting so we won't be bringing people in at that point. You may begin. Thanks, Pat. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, we're gonna try to keep this um, as short as possible considering what's going on in the world. I'm sure everyone wants to be able to keep an eye and, and watch the news, what's going on in Washington. Um, we do have two presentations today. We have the chiefs and deputy chiefs of the fire and police department with us. This evening, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're gonna open the meeting with a roll call. Um, so I'm gonna start with Stephanie. Present. Um, George. Present. Sarah. Here. Nate. Here. Did I see Jack? Is Jack with us? I don't think Jack's with us. No, Jack. I know Robert's going to be late. And of course, I am myself present. 
Um, we have no minutes from the prior meeting um, to approve or review. So without further ado, um, we're gonna step right into the first presentation. Uh, Chief, if you wanna go forward, Simonian, um, with your fire presentation, please. Okay, good evening. Thank you very much. I was on mute. I apologize. <clears throat> um, so yeah, uh, the presentation is up on the screen. Hopefully you can all see that, I hope. So we start off with our mission statement that we're dedicated to the community risk reduction through the application of prevention, education, and emergency services in the town of Yarmouth. Uh, Pat, do I advance or do you advance the slides? Uh I'll advance the slides for you, sir. Great, thank you very much. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is an overview of uh, our calls from the last few years. Uh, what you'll notice this year due to the COVID, um, we had a reduction in calls for service. Like many departments on Cape Cod, I, I looked on the, uh, the website of all the fire departments that are providing EMS on Cape Cod and every single one of them had a reduction in their call volume. I think there was a span of time early on where people just didn't want to go to the hospital. And uh, uh, unfortunately, some of them needed our service, but they were afraid to, uh, to go to the hospital. So 2019, we did 7,413 calls. Uh, this year, we ended up with 7,040. That's why it says uh, 731 plus. At the time that we did the presentation, uh, it wasn't uh, the end of the year yet. So we had done nine more calls since then. So our total was 7,040, uh, not 731. Uh, so this coming March of 2021 will be the final year of the SAFER grant, which the town share is 35%. Uh, I'm sorry, 65% uh, and the feds are 35%. Uh, Deputy Sawyer uh, was able to secure an extrication equipment grant that'll buy us uh, new jaws of life, uh, airbags, uh, stabilizers uh, for vehicles when they roll over. Uh, so that was a great uh, supplement to our to our funding uh, for new equipment. So we won't need that on the capital side. Also, Deputy Sawyer uh, secured a COVID grant, and um, that was huge. Also, uh, mm -hmm. to help supplement all the supplies and PPE that we needed to buy additionally uh, to deal with the COVID emergency. <laughs> Uh, other challenges are going to be the future uh, funding um, and and challenges with personnel and uh, keeping them keeping them at work. Next slide, please. Pat, can we get that next slide? Be number three. Yes, gentlemen, I'm trying as soon as I can get out of whatever's locking up my computer. No problem. Thank you. Technology. It's it's my favorite thing. <laughs> Best thing ever. It truly is. And I've got my share and I'm hitting enter that I did the last two times and it didn't go. Next. Well, let's pop you out of this. Pat, while well, you're um Next. Working on that, may I ask a question of uh sure. Sure. Um, and this is actually probably more for, for Dan, but um you mentioned COVID costs and getting a grant, but I seem to recall that the CARES Act included some funding, uh reimbursement funding for um COVID related costs for municipalities. Um so I'm just curious, uh A, if my memory is accurate on that and and um, you know, B, if Yarmouth is able to take advantage of that and recoup any, any COVID-related costs. Um, Mr. Chairman, yeah. So the way that works is there's um, uh, like a two-tier approach to that. One is um, if it's FEMA reimbursable, you have to go and check to see to what percentage that it's FEMA reimbursable. Then there's a, you know, if it is, then there's a sum of money that would be um, available for the town to pick up and then then, then you see if it's COVID under uh, covered under the CARES Act and then there's some stuff that's just clearly not FEMA available uh, fundable but it is CARES fundable so we keep track of all that and submit reports and we can certainly when finance comes in front of you we can get you a detailed breakdown as to where we're at right now I think our allocation under CARES 
was somewhere more than $2 million as a community. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Carry on. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, next slide uh, that shows our actual for FY 2020, uh, the FY 2021 budget and the proposed budget. Uh, we are on track. Uh, we're, we were about 50% in December uh, to start the new year. So we're doing good uh, as far as the department is concerned. Um, <clears throat> as far as the increases, uh, everyone all set with that slide? Okay, we'll go to the next one, slide four, please. Yes, sir. So that explains our, our changes in the budget, uh, which are the uh, COLAs and for the collective bargaining agreement, uh, the planned retirement for two employees. Um, and we ex increased the expense side by $640. So that says CMED. So what that is, the Bronxville County Sheriff uh, controls the patching of the ambulances to the emergency room via radio. And we have to pay every time the ambulance calls the hospital to make a reservation to bring a patient in. So he arbitrarily just raises those fees and we just have been absorbing them for a while, but we've asked now that we've gotten to a point we can't keep absorbing them. So that's a, a small increase to cover the costs of those. Um, <clears throat> Other things, uh, uh, our overtime was reduced by 50,000 um, back in May. You, I believe you got a presentation on that back in May with when Richmond Avenue was here. Uh, that still has been reduced. Um, we'd love to get that back at some point. Um, and also we were gonna get a little bit more money in vehicle maintenance because uh, the costs of, of maintaining the fleet keep increasing and we've been absorbing that. Um, and that 10,000 was taken away back in, in, uh, in May as well. So hopefully if things get better, we'd love to get that uh, back into our budget because we desperately need it. Thank you. Next slide, please. So challenges, uh, we have a lot. Uh, this is some of the highlights, uh, but there are others as well. Um, so you've seen qu quite a few of these things in the past. Um, you know, we've had a couple of studies done over the years that, that keep saying that we need to uh, increase our staffing. And uh, while we're talking about staffing, the next round of SAFER grant, which is the one that's supposed to expire in March, uh, there is no cost share to the town. So the feds are paying 100%, not, not 75, 75, 35. It's 100% for three years. So when it comes to staffing, uh, now is, I know it's a tough time to bring it up with everything going on, but it's almost not a better time to do it because the feds are covering it for three years at 100%. And that's never happened before. So um, the other issue is uh, with, especially with the storms and everything getting worse, uh, we have a hardened facility in West Yarmouth at station three. And uh, I would love to see our dispatch moved out of the headquarters station uh, to the upstairs of station three. So it's in a uh, protected building. And I know several of you have, uh, have gone to station three and have seen the upstairs of that, uh, mostly on the capital budget side. Um, the other issue is our supervisor, our captain that's on the shift is currently still riding apparatus, which means he could be driving the ambulance or in the front seat of the pumper or on the ladder truck. And he's often called upon by the dispatch center to make critical decisions with other emergencies in town. We would like to isolate him from the apparatus in his own command vehicle um, and take him off the apparatus so he can make better decisions. And I think that's uh, long overdue. Uh, if you look at the communities on the Cape that operate multiple fire stations as we do, they have realized the importance of that and taken the captain and put him in the car. Um, if we could increase our staffing by four more personnel, I believe we'd be able to facilitate that and, and put him in the car. Also, the EMS training supervisor, um, he is overwhelmed even more now with all the COVID stuff, as well as maintaining all the EMT and paramedic stuff. He's also doing the fire training as well. So with everything going on medically, obviously the fire training side suffers. And fires are very low frequency, but they're very high risk and we need to train our personnel. Uh, we would love at some point to isolate that position and have a training captain who's actually the fire training captain in charge of the division of training and have the Lieutenant EMS supervisor still in place to deal with all the EMS related 
issues. Uh, fire prevention continues to be very busy and uh, we'd love to seek another person in that division at some point. And the mechanic is, uh, is a big deal, I think, with us as well. The, um, the farming out of our apparatus um, is becoming very, very costly. Uh, these heavy truck mechanic shops, either the mobile guys that come to our department or when we actually have to send them back to the dealerships or the heavy truck mechanic facilities, uh, their labor rates continue to grow. Um, the parts for these trucks are, are becoming astronomical. They're getting difficult to get. They're coming from like the middle of the country or out of the country and they're getting, we're getting huge freight charges added to the, uh, which go, coincides with why I need more vehicle maintenance money uh, to repair and keep these vehicles on the road. We've had a pumper out of service, a reserve engine for over a year now um, because we uh, didn't have enough money to maintain that truck and keep it on the road. So 1999, um, it's the second oldest piece of apparatus we have as far as the pumpers. Uh, the training, training budget, I'd love to see that increase if we could uh, to 150,000 at some point. Um, again, it's very difficult for the guys to train on duty. Uh, they, they all assembled today at the old Pirates Cove uh, gift shop on Route 28 in South Yarmouth. They're going to be tearing that building down and they tried to facilitate some on duty training there with the apparatus. And of course, you know, calls come in and, and it gets interrupted and uh, they had to leave the training obviously to respond to emergencies. So it's very difficult for them to train on duty. Uh, so the additional money, we would be able to pull those guys off duty and facilitate training and not be interrupted by emergency calls. Uh, and obviously the COVID and PPE expenses are going to continue to grow. And uh, also we'd like to see an increase in the expense side on protective clothing and EMS supplies because um, right now we're doing great, but at some point, I'm not sure if it'll be continued to be funded. Uh, over the next year or so. Um, and the cost of that stuff continues to get it more expensive as well. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so these are the recommendations to address the challenges. Um, if, we, if we increase uh, manpower to get up to that, shift level to have the captain in the car. Uh, if we do it incrementally at, at four personnel, you know, every two to three years, I think we can get there. Um, I'd like to budget the move uh, to dispatch to station three to get it out of this building and, and into that protected facility in West Yarmouth. Uh, the captain in the car, um, again, uh, that's, that's really important to get him off the piece of apparatus and in the car for decision-making and to maintain the, uh, the three station configuration. And then the increased staffing, uh, the training officer, fire prevention, dispatch, uh, mechanic, they'll increase the base wages, but have no effect on the overtime. And then we're gonna continue to go after grants to support COVID needs and everything else in this department. Uh, Deputy Sawyer is very active. He's, we're in the grant cycle currently right now. Um, and he's busy writing those grants uh, to help supplement the department. So we are actively doing that every year. Next slide, please. That's it. I'll be happy to entertain any questions and um, some of I might defer to Deputy Sawyer if it, it falls into his realm. Thanks, Chief. Any, anybody have questions? I'm sure there's some out there. Well, I have a couple of questions. Um, did we talk, I'm sure I've heard this number before in last in prior presentations. What is the cost to move dispatch? Do we have a, a ballpark number? Well, it, uh, it's, it's complicated of, is what I would tell you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> everything's complicated. Well, there's equipment that would have to be purchased. Do you want to include the police department on it? There's a conversation related to uh, having civilian dispatch activities. I mean, we have $100,000 in an article to begin the process of examining what that is. And then, you know, in general, what I can tell you is that unless you have a regional partner, it's very difficult to make it cost effective. And we have not yet been able to successfully execute an agreement with a regional partner. So um, I think it's worthwhile. And it was a board goal to um, study that uh, activity. 
I think to the Chiefs point, you know, um, Station 3, there's a lot of sense to that based on its construction and whatnot. Um, but it's difficult to see that from here, especially if it adds new costs to the town, which it would in front of what's in front of us now is uh, problematic. You know, you saw the laundry list of asks that the chief just mentioned to you now. Imagine, you know, adding a few more million dollars to that. And we've just started the budget process and it's a problem. I think the comment I'd like to make to that, and I'm, I'm sure our chief would agree with me, is, you know, that last tornado we had, which was the first I'd ever seen in 46 years, uh, I thought would probably be the last one. And then we, you know, started to have the buzz of a tornado. I don't know, was it a month ago or two months ago? I don't remember when it was, but, you know, obviously the weather patterns on the Cape have changed. And I think having a secure location is probably an advisable um, yeah, you know, just on that topic, though, Brian, you raise a good point. And uh, we had a briefing last year after the tornado from National Weather Service. And what came from that is with the advancements in radar that they have recently uh, had with their uh, equipment is they, they had indicated to us, you know, because I asked that question specifically to the uh, to the person providing the uh, seminar was that, you know, what did we call these kinds of storms when we hear today? Uh, a warning that there's rotation in a cell that's near our proximity. He said in the past, we would have just put out a, um, a severe thunderstorm warning. And, that, and that's what it would have been because they had no ability to see uh, the rotation that, the, that goes on. And the other issue that they pick up now is the uh, flying debris they're picking up with uh, the speed of that with the radar. So with, I guess I'd be careful with saying that there's more storms on the uptick. I think it's our ability to detect them for what they really are more scientifically with technology. So going forward in the future, you'll probably hear many more what I'd call quote unquote tornado warnings because of the advancement of technologies or in the past, they would have just been severe thunderstorm warnings. Fair enough. Um, I can tell you firsthand that it was scary because if we got hit at our house for about $20,000, yeah, I'm not going to underestimate what Nate just said. It is very scary, and I lived through a significant one in Westfield prior to my arrival here, and and I look at thunderstorm warnings, whatever they are today, with more trepidation than I ever have in my entire life. There's no question. Yeah. Uh, my last question would be in regards to the mechanic. Would that mechanic work in the new DPW building to use that? Well, that's another really good question. So what we did with the DPW building is we um, did a change order recently to put in a larger size lift to take on. I think at the time it was to accommodate 10 wheel dump trucks, but it may also be able to accommodate uh, some fire apparatus. There is a little bit more or different certification depending upon what the uh, mechanic is working on, but it's certainly something that facility, I think it would be fair to say could likely accommodate uh, what the chief is talking about. I, but you know, it is a different union altogether. Uh, there is a police mechanic that will operate out of that facility. That that mechanic operates right now out of the water department facility, but that activity will will go over to um, the new public works building. So I think that's worthy of a dialogue. And um, there's plenty of communities that have a uh, in-house fire mechanic. Less have probably police mechanics, more have fire mechanics. Um, so that that point's well taken from the chief. Yeah, and if I could, uh, <clears throat> Dan, uh, I talked with Jeff, and he did assure me that the lifts that were purchased would pick up our biggest truck, which is the ladder, the tower. Well, there you go. So that that's that's great that they planned for that. That's very smart. So yeah, a mechanic would need to have the emergency vehicle or the EVT certifications to work on the fire apparatus, which is what we have uh, currently. We have a couple mobile guys that come here, and then uh, believe it or not, I drove one of the pumpers for warranty work back to. Um, the dealership in Walpole, Mass. today um, because it, it had to go back to the dealer. But again, it's, um, <clears throat> you know, these, these trucks are big and they're expensive and they cost a lot to maintain and repair when they break. So I think if we could have somebody, and plus there's a timing now, they'll have this truck up in Walpole for who knows how many days, possibly over a week to deal what they got to deal with. And that means we're not going to have that truck. If we had somebody in-house, I think we could get repairs done, especially the smaller ones, a lot more timely. Anybody have any other questions? I have a question. Um, I missed a little bit of it, so I apologize, but the um, chief in the truck that you were talking about, chief, I, and I know I just yeah. got my terms mixed up. That's okay. Can you just, yeah, um, that's something that 
caught my attention. Can you just like de- um, go into a little more detail on that? Sure. Like, so what I, it would really entail for like yeah. costs? Um, well, basically, we currently have the captains on duty right now. There's one on each group. So there's currently four what we call shift, ca- shift captains or shift commanders. Okay. And right now, they're part of a uh, crew that responds to calls in the ambulances or the, or the fire trucks. What we're asking to do is pull him out of that and put him in his own supervisor vehicle by himself. I'm going to give you an example. So similar to like the police, the police have a sergeant in one of their cruisers and he's the shift supervisor. Um, And on the fire side, I'll I'll give you an example. I was a captain for five years here, years ago. Um, My dispatcher, while I'm driving the ambulance with lights and siren to the hospital with two paramedics in the back working on a patient is calling me on the radio. I have to answer him on the radio as well as pay attention to the traffic on route 28 and make decisions to other emergencies that are coming into town. It's really not a good practice. Years ago, when we weren't that busy, it wasn't as, as bad, but now doing over 7,000 calls a year, uh, that captain is called upon on an average 20 times a day. You know, we do 20 plus calls a day. He's, he's being called several times to make critical decisions on responses as he's operating a vehicle or riding in the front seat of another pumper, thinking about the call he's going to. So if he's responding to a call in the fire truck or the tower ladder, he's concentrating, okay, I'm going to uh, Windsor Nursing Home, and I'm concentrating on that. But now I'm getting called for another call to make a decision on. So I think it's a much better environment if you take him off the piece and put him in. And we also formalize our incident command system on the arrival of that captain. Currently, they have to wait for a command vehicle to show up. And that's either myself or the deputy chief. And now, of course, during the day isn't as big a problem. But after hours, we're coming from home. And there's a time delay there. So they're standing in the street holding a portable radio, trying to be an incident commander without having a vehicle with a command center in it. So the deputy chief's car and my car in the rear hatch area has a full command system with radios, pull out drawers with dry erase boards so we can manage an incident and keep track of our personnel and keep everybody safe. So really it's a safety thing in my opinion. I think it's long overdue. Um, We're one of the last big departments on the Cape here that run multiple stations that don't have the captain in the car. And, uh, and Hyannis Fire runs one fire station alone, and they they have a captain in the car. Deputy, go ahead and add some. You're on mute still. Yeah, I was. Like... Uh, Pat asked me to test my camera. That's all. <laughs> and I did. Well, it does her. look like we have cameras going again. Oh, and we're I... on. oh hi everyone. <laughs> I took my tongue um, off too. Oh boy. I do actually. Just a follow up though on that is the answer to the solution like to making what you're asking for happen is it a personnel thing or is it a truck is it like a equipment thing or is it a little bit of both uh it's a little bit of both i mean historically what we have done is um well we need to add four personnel because i need to replace that captain who's currently riding on the truck especially the ambulance we run three people on an ambulance one person drives and two in the back attending to the patient so We need to take him away from that. So we'd need to increase the staffing by four more personnel. That would would facilitate that. Uh, As far as the vehicle goes, historically what we've done is, um, uh, you know, when the deputy or myself gets a new vehicle, our Tahoe would be passed down with the command center. It can go to the captain. In this instance, we'd probably, it'd probably be a capital expense. We'd probably have to buy a new one. we can use a pickup truck temporarily, one of our service vehicles to get the ball rolling until the next capital cycle and then uh, go from there. But, um, uh, but yeah, so it's a combination of both. Thanks. Stephanie. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so Chief, I, did I see the slide correct uh, as far as um, the new personnel numbers was 16? So the study, yeah, the, so the, the study said we, were, we should add 16 personnel. Mm-hmm. So that's four per shift, we have four shifts. So that's what the two studies said years ago. And mm-hmm. that would get us to an 18 person group if everybody came to work, but not everybody comes to work every single day of the, of the year. So right now we'd be able to, um, 
uh, increase our minimum staffing with more personnel as well. So currently we operate with five at the main station, three at station two and three at station three. The problem with five at the main station is when an ambulance goes out with three, there's only two guys left. Now I got to bring a guy in from home and we have so many simultaneous calls, which also is what that study identified. Our concurrent call volume is very high for a community this size. So what happens is a lot of times another station, which is further away, has to start going to that call. And these gentlemen at this station leave with two people and go to the call. So now I'm tying up two ambulances with five people for a medical call when really I, if I had another three here at this station, they could go to that call. So um, that's what you, that's one of the challenges, but that's not yeah. what you're proposing in the budget. So, I mean, I saw a $250,000 increase. That's just the, the contractual raises for the COLAs uh, for the- That's not new, any new staff? No, no, I didn't put anything in because of the situation we're in with COVID right now and stuff. I mean, I'd love to, if things were different, I would love to get that. But, you know, again, we, we, we've studied this twice. We've, we've been talking about it since- I mean, we, since we manned that third station in West Yarmouth and, and you know, which goes back to 07, uh, but yet here we are, it was great. We got the four, it was, it was the first manpower increase since 2003. So that's great. Um, but I think we keep, we can't stop. We have to kind of incrementally get there. Um, and, you know, four at a time is manageable, especially when the safer grant is paying a hundred percent. So that gives us three years to plan for funding those positions, whether it be another slight increase in the ambulance rates or, or, or we do something else and, and hopefully estimated receipts get better after we get done with COVID and a year or two and everyone's vaccinated, the timing might work out um, with that three-year period. I'm hopeful. So the four have already started? Oh yeah, they're already working the four yeah. on the original one. Yeah, that was, that, that, this is our last year of that first cycle of Safer Grant. Okay. Uh, so they're so in place. Two, yeah, they're in place. They're running calls every day. So we've got two years then to come up with a plan to pay for them? No, no. Um, so the first four that we got on the grant have already been funded. So we, we okay. planned for that already. Yep. Right now, there is a savings to the town of 35% uh, this year. The last two previous years, the town only had to pay uh, 25% and the feds paid 75% of those four new positions. This year being the third year, the cost share goes down significantly. So we're on the hook for 65, the feds are on the hook for 35. But what I'm saying is going forward, if we apply this year and, and are successful and the deputy's like, you know, he's like eight for eight on grants now. Um, so uh, if, we're, if we apply and we're successful, they will pay a hundred percent for the next three years. So of the, the, town same, the same four people or no, four, four additional new people, four additional new people. But the four current people, there wouldn't be a funding stream to pay for them. They're already funded. They're already paid for in the budget. Once this grant runs out. That's what I'm asking. Is once the budget, once the. Once the, this the, grant yeah. runs out. Yes. Once this grant runs out, the mm -hmm. four positions are fully funded going forward. In okay. Our, and that, in and our budget. And that amounts to how much? How much do we need to be looking at for next year? Um, I, I would defer to Ed on that. He may he may know better. Oh, with the ballpark idea. Uh, Stephanie, the, you can get back. It? You can get back to us. Stephanie, can you hear me? Yes, Ed. Uh, what we did was based on lessons learned from other communities. We fully funded the initial year the entire amount of the wages for the four individuals. Uh, that was done through a reduction in overtime, increase in um, the rates for the ambulance, and we're still very low compared to other communities with our ambulance rates. And we funded that at the beginning. What we ended up doing for each of the three years was the savings uh, reverted back to free cash. So in another community, they took on I think four to eight firefighters, they got to the end of the grant period, did not have any funding. They had to lay off people. They had to um, pay back some of the grant. And we avoided that by fully funding it from the beginning. And what we're getting from the reimbursement goes to free cash. 
So okay. we're not in a situation where we have to increase our budget for the fire department uh, because of the drop off of the grant. Okay. So that's probably, that would that be the approach moving forward? Um, I would like it to be that way. Although, you know, it's gonna, if they need staff, it's gonna be some time before we're gonna be able to, you know, get back to budgeting a lot of uh, the things that people are requesting, you know, depending on where the economy is, you know, people are looking to get the roads back into the levy and, and the $1.5 million in capital spending back to levy, into the levy. So um, if we'd have to take a flyer on the fact that we could come up with that money in three years to be able to fully pay for that, or what we can do is increase the ambulance rates and do some other things like, hey, what's, the, what's gonna be the impact on the overtime? Is that gonna go down because we've increased staff? It is so gonna we wanna be creative again to really fully fund that before we go in. We can again take the 100% each year that goes to free cash and that could uh, ensure that we don't have to get to the end of the three year period and look to lay people off either, either at, at fire or somewhere else. Great, yeah, I would love to see, not right now, but at some point just a kind of projection of um, what those different options are uh, as far as, you know, how to pay for what the total cost would be, um, you know, including the, how that affects over time, but also how it affects training. Cause I saw you wanted to increase the training budget. And then if you add people, then that's logically would increase the training budget. Um, so what that would look like and yeah, kind of the plan to pay for it. But generally I think that it makes sense if you've got the feds paying for it for three years. I mean, I think <laughs> knock on wood, we're gonna be out of this and, and a lot stronger position in three years. Um, and then the last thing is just a, a comment on CMED. I, I recall the battle that uh, Cape Chiefs went through with um, the, the sheriff um, a few years ago when I worked at the state house. And, um, you know, it was a battle that we lost uh, in terms of, you know, um, sort of control of, of CMED and whatnot. But, it, you know, if that is continuing to be a problem, it might be time to revisit that conversation on a Cape wide basis. Um, because that, uh, I do recall that that, that was, was a significant cost across the Cape. Yeah, Thank it, you. It, it continues to go up because he's a state entity now and the state wants the users to fund everything over there, not, not the state. So he's passing the costs on to all the users. And um, so that, you know, it's gonna continue to go. I mean, we're lucky it's a small increase uh, at right now, but it's over $20,000 a year for us to call the hospital and make an appointment, which I think is ridiculous. Yeah, my recollection is that it, it was- It was never charged. It wasn't charged. clear that it was actually the cost that was getting paid on because there wasn't a clear budget that was associated with it and transparency was an issue. So that again, might be something worth, you know, right. So right. Rose. Those four, Phil, those four um, officers that you wanted to hire, how long would it take to put the paperwork through and find those people and stuff like that? Uh, not very long. I mean, we, we actively um, I have, have a running file of, of paramedics and EMTs. Uh, you know, some of them are, are our on-call firefighters, obviously. We would love to move them up into the full-time ranks. So we have a farm system in place that we can draw from. As well as uh, you know, we we currently have several applications for uh, for paramedic as well. So, but I think we're doing really well on paramedic right now. I think um, each group. So there's 15 people on a group, and eight out of the 15 are paramedics, which is a great number. <clears throat> so, even if a couple are off, either on vacation or unfortunately out sick or on a personal day, I usually have four or five still to operate. Uh, the ambulances out of the stations. Now the outlying stations, stations two and three might only have one paramedic and there might be two here or three here at headquarters because we operate two ambulances out of the main station. So, uh, but we're doing very well on the paramedic side. Um, so uh, our on-call firefighter uh, program and high school intern program, uh, that's the farm system. So we can always draw from that as well. And, and we like to give our high school kids a career path to full-time as what I did when I was 16 and I got on the fire department. So. Okay, thank you. Do we have any further questions?
No, are we all set? All right, I think we're good. Chief, we're good, thank you. Deputy Chief, hey. thank you for coming. Um, you're more than welcome to stay on and listen to the next uh, presentation if you'd like. Thank you very much. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Thank you. All right, we have next Chief Fredrickson. Chief, are you with us? I am. I'll Good turn evening. my video on so we can see each other. Look at that. Amazing. Um, hope you're all doing well tonight. Uh, you have copies of the presentation. We start with our mission statement. The Yarmouth Police Department is a proactive police agency dedicated to the excellence by ensuring quality customer service for everyone we serve by way of teamwork, accountability, and community involvement. And that is something we, we really live by. Next. Uh, going over some of the highlights for the year, the uh, calls for service were down by about 1,500 calls this year, uh, mostly due to COVID. And, you know, when you have curfews at, at 930 and all the other things that were going on, schools being out, uh, it definitely impacted our, uh, our call numbers. Uh, with that, we had to shift what we do uh, because we had a lot of businesses that were uh, unprotected. We put an extra effort into overnight protection of our businesses. And things have stable off. We only had 12 uh, business break-ins this year, uh, which ironically was the exact amount uh, of last year in uh, 2019. Uh, so COVID, like everybody, has uh, changed a lot of what we do, how we do it. Um, the impact of making arrests, doing virtual arraignments, not uh, uh, kind of dissuading uh, arrests. Uh, you had to do something pretty significant in order to find yourself in a uh, police headquarters, whether it's intoxicated or uh, a crime. It uh, was, um, we did our very best to keep people out of here because we didn't want to affect our building or the officers to go home to their family. Uh, mental health uh, it, issues continue to be uh, pretty prominent and uh, they were increased. And also what is hard to put a, um, a number to or to evaluate is the types, the actual degree to which they, uh, they are done. Um, for example, uh, Halloween night, we had two bizarre incidents. Uh, one where uh, uh, a resident uh, started uh, readying his, his home with, with plastic and knives and went and told his uh, wife that he was gonna kill her. Uh, so that created some anxiety. We ended up making an arrest on that. And not uh, two hours later, we had a, a person arrive in the lobby of the station bleeding, uh, claiming that she, was a, uh, she had run over her husband and was a victim of a, a domestic violence. And sure enough, it was, uh, she ran over her husband, sorry. Um, and that was the case, a bizarre scene where she was assaulted and threatened at her home, was chased by her spouse, uh, got in a car, got in a car chase, uh, got stopped by him, tried to get her out of the car. She took off, dragged him 1,500 feet under the car. Uh, and so we that, that's the type of things that have you know, different, like there's been an elevation. I'm not sure whether it's due to stress or, or you know, whatever else is going on. But those types of things are, are there. Um, we've had some uh, promotions, uh, a bunch of different uh, sergeants get promoted. Um, and of course, you know, the deputy uh, has been on for a year now. So uh, he's uh, my right hand man, uh, does an amazing job. So it's, we're still learning uh, each other's roles. And you know, my role has shifted. We've got three great lieutenants that are that are, that are taking care of all types of issues, uh, tracking you know COVID like with everybody else has changed a lot of things the way we have to do it. And you know during those first uh, several weeks and, and months, uh, the changes were daily and consistent. And of course, right now we're dealing with with the impact of COVID and the increase, uh, having offices in and out, uh, it's been amazing over the past few weeks, the ones that have been exposed and might've been exposed 
We don't know. Some have it. Keeping them out, and it's been I describe it like a hockey game. We got you know people on the bench coming in, and other got people going out, and it's like every day it's somebody different. But uh, we're, we're we're dealing it, and I'm, I'm proud of the staff for doing that. Uh, recruitment um, and retention challenges. We we're there. Uh, we're losing one of our finest young officers to the city of Framingham. Um, I'm really disappointed. I love that kid. Um, he is an exceptional human being, uh, but he's going there because of basically benefits and, and uh, a different way of life. Uh, and it's unfortunate. We usually don't lose that many people, especially young ones, but uh, we can see it happening. Uh, and recruiting uh, police officers, you know, with the 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 atmosphere and policing and the the attitude towards police officers, particularly from uh, people within our own uh, government, um, it's challenging for officers to keep their heads up or want to even get into the field. Um, but the ones we have been able to uh, come work for us, we got one starting next Monday, and these are exceptional young men and women that are coming through. And I'm so proud of what we've been able to do, but I don't know how long it's going to last because there's, there's several officers right now talking about just leaving. We had one retire today um, and they don't want to uh, go through some of these uh, significant changes and the stress of everything and the, the attitude towards them. And it's not just them, it's towards their families. When their, their, their kids are on uh, Twitter or Instagram, whatever they do, and they hear their, their peers in school talk about how they hate the police and, and this and that, and that, that hurts them. They don't want their families being hurt. So we deal with that. Um, so that creates problems with retention. Um, so, but we, we are doing our best to, to keep, uh, keep the morale high. Um, we've had a tremendous amount of uh, traffic complaints and parking complaints this summer was particularly increased because of the amount of people that wanted to go to the beach to have something to do because of the obviously the restricted environment we're in. Uh, the other thing that is is so prominent is the high volume of fraud and white collar crime. They just, uh, I don't know, it's tough to do. It's really tough to get involved with them. It's a lot of work, a lot of expertise. Um, so that uh, continues to be uh, very challenging for us. Okay, uh, you can take a look at the budget numbers. Uh, you know, our, our, our proposed budget right now is actually less than it was in um, FY20. Um, we are held that has to do with uh, the amount of um, officers. To, when we have a senior officer leave, a junior officer comes in, you know, the pay differences uh, through what happened 10 years ago with the uh, elimination of the Quinn bill for um, for the new highs after 2010. So that's kind of where a lot of that balance has come up. And of course, then we don't have a uh, uh, labor relations agreements for um, FY22 uh, and 21 for that matter. Um, yet we are, we're working on that. We're, we have uh, agreements with the supervisors union, but those not have been finalized as of yet. Um, you see that that on track the end, you know, we got cut fifty thousand dollars in overtime, and we also got cut our um, uh, justice grant for that we used over the past ten or so years to fund our overtime for our, uh, narcotics investigations. So we're looking at one hundred and ten thousand dollars that we don't have available to us. On top of that is our um, overtime has not kept pace with COLAs over the past five or six years. It's always level funded. It seems like, you know, overtime's like a four letter word to, to some people. So I know that I think we, we, we spend too much, but we, we justify all of our overtime. And it's a struggle right now to keep uh, the services available, keep our officers safe uh, and keep the public safe. So we're struggling with that and we, we need to address that. And I think in these times, this is not when we should be cutting our services for public safety, police uh, or fire. Uh, so that, that's what's happening. And uh, so we gotta pay attention to that. Our expenses, you know, they you can see the, the difference. They, you know, they're not, um, they're not big increases. 
uh, and they've been minimal or none uh, for years. And we just keep, I don't know how we do it sometimes. We just, by hook or by crook, we rob Peter to pay Paul, find different ways to make it work or do without. Um, so we, we struggle again. I mean, there are things we just can't control is our CAD system they, that, that increases 5% a year, whether we like it or not. Uh, I know Stephanie, you would ask a question about ammunition for prices. I can get those prices and I'm sorry, I got those uh, those questions at 551. So I'll do a better job trying to get specific answers for the ones you, you, you wanted. Um, but uh, some ammunition, uh, nine millimeter ammunition is almost to the point where it's a dollar per round, which is somewhere is about a 65% increase uh, over just a couple of years ago. Uh, and the other problem we have is try to get ammunition. It is sold out. We, uh, 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 what's happening in America with the, you know, <laughs> the environment we're in, uh, there's a lot of hoarding of ammunition for fears of what might take place. Uh, but it impacts us because we need it to keep our officers safe and the public safe. Um, so it's it's a struggle with ammunition. You can hit the next slide. Uh, changes uh, the salary discrete, uh, decrease is is what I said. It's a, it's a result of the changing salaries of you know taking a top step Quinnbill funded person at twenty five percent for the masters to bring someone in bottom step patrol officer that doesn't get any education pay. It it, it, it works its uh, way out. Uh, that's been happening uh, for 10 years now. Every time we, uh, we talked about the, the OT cut, um, you know, and we've had to reduce our deployments, uh, training and our investigations. And we tell them no investigations other than when you're working right now. And that's not a good way to do it when you get uh, someone's a victim of a sexual assault and they have to do it at a certain time to get an interview done or, or meet with a parent. Uh, it's, it's challenging, so we're trying to make that work. Uh, the expenses you can see on the on the screen there, some of the stuff was removed due to the cuts we had uh, uh, this, this past year. Uh, of course, we'd love to get it all back, but uh, we understand that this is a difficult time financially for the, for the whole town, and it's not just us. And you're gonna hear this probably from each, each division that you, you speak with in, in the coming weeks. Um, you will see on the bottom there, I'm not sure if this falls on your prayer view, we talked about the taser. We had a three year plan. Uh, we're working that, it's been morphed because um, the way it was supposed to work that uh, we'd have a five year plan. Uh, I know Ed and the deputy uh, found that there were some, some procurement issues that had to be addressed. So they, they're finding another way to make it all work because the, uh, the tasers need to be replaced and, re and replaced now. Uh, some of them are failing and we, we're uh, doing the very best we can with them. Can you hit the next slide? Thank you. Uh, challenges that we said that the COVID-19 is still with us and will be for, for lots of reasons because, uh, you know, there are, there are cases where, uh, for example, uh, there was a rollover truck accident uh, a couple of weeks ago up on the highway. Truck went right off the, off the bridge. The officers uh, had to get there and get, drag someone right out of the, um, the vehicle. Uh, as it caught fire. Uh, so, and of course, the person that was in the driving said he had COVID. So, and the officers, you know, you can't function sometimes with gloves and masks and put them on that quickly. So, with an abundance of caution, we, we had to set them out of work and make sure they were, were not infected, get the, uh, thanks to the fire department helping us getting the information on uh, whether the person was uh, positive or negative for COVID. He turned out he wasn't. So that, that worked okay. You know, unfunded man, mandates. Um, you know, we just had this police, so-called police reform bill that was passed. Um, there are mandates in there for a new training, which is which is all fine. We Some of the training subjects are, are actually pretty good, um, but we've already done our in-service training for uh, most of the department, but now there's new training that has to be done immediately. And we got to figure out how do we do that? How do we, how do we pay for that? Um, so those are challenges and they, that's why sometimes these things come out. Even like uh, holidays, when the governor declares something a holiday and it gets passed with this legislature. All right, well, that's great. They passed that, that works, but you know what? Now we have people that aren't working another day a year. 
And how do you replace them? You replace them on all the time. Uh, that's the only way you can do it. Uh, and we're, we're not an agency that we can just say, we're not gonna, we're not gonna fix the pothole today that can wait till tomorrow. Our services, our emergency services, just like fire, we have to be there ready to respond. Um, so uh, we have unanticipated OT costs with uh, injuries. We've been pretty good with that. However, it happened on COVID, but that creates problems here when they want someone's not working. We have one officer out right now. He will probably never come back to work um, because he's going to retire over the next uh, eight or 10 weeks. I uh, heard his shoulder off duty. Injured on duty? No. But yet the impact is the same as though it was because he's not here every day coming to work and we have to replace him. Um, we talked about the expense budgets already. It's a level funded year after year, uh, minimal increases if that. We try to do some fixes, but they get cut. And uh, uh, we just keep rolling with it. Uh, labor relations agreements, those are, those are challenging. Like I said, we, we still have one more contract we have to settle and then one we have to finish up with the supervisor, the patrol one. We're actually meeting with them tomorrow. So we'll see where that goes. Uh, we you just never know. They have not been with a co with ha had a contract since July first of uh, twenty. Uh, one of our biggest concerns is officer staff and wellness. Um, that is important that, as the leader of the department that we are taking care of the people who are taking care of everybody else. Uh, I mentioned uh, a little bit about what what can happen, particularly with the angst towards police. But it isn't just that, it's the stuff they see and do every day. There are some things that they can't unsee and never will. Um, but keeping that in mind, we need to take care of their well-being. We owe it to them. So we, you know, we have the psychologists, we had everybody mandated, everybody go to. Uh, it worked out very well. Uh, we need to continue that year after year and perhaps even more often than year after year. We talked about the overtime not proportional with COLA increases, the justice grant that isn't there anymore. Uh, Stephanie, uh, we do continue to, that one of your questions was about that grant. We do continue to uh, uh, look for grants here and there, but quite honestly, there are some grants coming out that with the police reform, I'm not sure we really want to accept them to expose our officers to uh, be in an environment where they can be subject to uh, unnecessary complaints, but we'll see what they all are. We'll gladly uh, uh, um, keep looking and looking. Uh, next slide. Um, recommendations. Um, the expense budget should be uh, increased by 25,000. Uh, we talked about this in the last couple of finance committees over the past couple of years to have a uh, separate account for new higher equipment and uniforms because it's a, it's a moving target year to year. Um, I think fire would benefit from that too, so it doesn't hit our expense budget. Um, the uh, overtime increase needs to match our contractual increase. Otherwise, we're just strangling our, our ability to provide our services. Uh, we are negotiating a new shift schedule. That is one of the things that uh, did take place with the supervisor's contract. And once we get it finalized, you'll be able to see that. Uh, one huge area that, that is kind of a kind of a hole uh, in the department is our dispatchers, their um, their their pay compared to the other public safety dispatchers across uh, the Cape. Uh, we are very very low, and uh, we're going to get to a point where we're going to lose them. It is, it is not easy getting dispatchers uh, because they're they're a unique profession. It is really grown into a real profession where they have to multitask with technology, uh, have an ear to, ear to the radio, understand people, be able to communicate, de-escalate, do all types of, of things. It's a real profession and they need to be compensated for that. Um, so we have to pay attention to that. And the problem they have in their own union, they're in with SEIU and they, uh, in my opinion, they're not um, fairly represented by them because they're, they're the only ones that work shift work. Uh, uh, public safety just work in, in that union and it's it's not addressed uh, appropriately. Um, you know, just uh, I think there are some solutions to some of our immediate budgets over the next few years with both police and fire, if, uh, particularly with our overtime. 
Um, and I gladly have discussions with that. I think it is there. You know, I think there, there are some funds there, but you are the finance committee and I need to work with you. I don't want to tell you how to do your job, but, uh, but there are solutions. And the other thing I might add is that with this police reform, you know, uh, I think it was a disingenuous uh, way that it was handled. Not that it's all bad, it really isn't, trust me. Uh, but, you know, if we really wanted to take a look at police um, conduct and how it works, we should have body cameras. We have asked here, I know it's a very expensive piece, but I think uh, statewide, we should all have them. And we should make that a priority with the with any funds that we have available to implement them and get them moving. We owe it to our offices, we owe it to our citizens, we owe it to those who feel like they've been victimized to uh, have the documentation of our offices at hand. Because the way it stands now is we're the only ones that don't have video documentation at any incident. I think that is something that uh, we need to seriously consider and not, not in two or three years, it should happen within this year. And that's, that might sound ambitious, but we need to be for, for, the, uh, for our officers own peace of mind. And I think that is it. I think we're open to questions at this point. Thank you, Chief. Um, let's open it up to questions. Anybody have any questions yeah. for Chief? Chief? Body cameras, would the uh, officers, the officers union at one time was against them. Has that changed? Well, the supervisors have agreed. I think that discussion may come up uh, with a, our negotiation there. The tune has changed. And, and honestly, I would fight the fight, even if there are some that might, uh, like in any negotiation, the way negotiations go, I think some of you have been experienced in that, that anything you try to get from the union, it's always like, what are you going to give me for it? But yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we need to make it happen. I think the attitude within the group, they want them as mm -hmm. much as it could be an ask for what are you going to give me for it? Because it does lose the yeah. working conditions. But I think it changes it for the positive. And I think it's how, something. How many should... of them would you need and how much a camera? Well, uh, Deputy, you want to speak to that a little bit? You may you might have the more clear information on that. Sure. There's, uh, there's different camera systems out there. Uh, but the most popular one is a company called Axon. Uh, the cameras run about $800 to $1,000 a piece. And the price of the camera isn't really the issue. And we would get one for each officer uh, so that they have it when they're working uh, a regular shift or working a, an overtime shift or a detail. Where you run into an issue is when you have to have month, uh, a monthly maintenance fee because all the video is stored in the cloud. So then we can retrieve it. Uh, Mashpee just launched a program. They're using a, a program called WatchGuard. Uh, that's a that's a manufacturer of that camera. I'm not sure of the cost of those, but they're all they all run run between the eight hundred and a thousand dollar range. And then you know your real up cost comes from maintaining the data. Uh, you, you look at the Brewster Police Department; they've had cruiser cameras for a long period of time, and that's created a uh, an issue for them just in the fact that there's a lot of uh, public records requests for the the footage. There's also requests when you go to court. Uh, even for a speeding ticket, they had issues where they would issue a speeding ticket and then someone would want the video from that. Someone has to be able to retrieve it. But um, when I did my master's degree in 2015, my, my capstone project was on the, uh, the viability of a body cam program for the town of Yarmouth and what would it cost. And you just look at what lawsuits can cost a municipality now in the millions of dollars if we lose a lawsuit because uh, we don't yeah. have the footage that could back up what an officer did. You just look at the shooting that just happened in Milton. We don't know what happened inside that apartment building or, or in that store rather. A, a, a camera would change that drastically to see what happened. Uh, so the, uh, the, the cost benefit analysis uh, leans towards getting cameras would be the right thing to do for our officers. And uh, it would help us because it, would, it eliminates, you look at the history of cameras and how they've been used, they eliminate frivolous complaints. Somebody files a complaint against an officer and they have been, there have been studies that have shown that those complaints go away almost immediately when you say, okay, well, let's sit down and look at the, look, let's look at the footage and see what happens. It also holds people more accountable because if we know that our, if our officers know that they are being recorded while they're doing their jobs, their professionalism rises. Not to say that they're not professional now, but there are times where people can get under your skin and, and you may say something that probably isn't the, the most proper thing. Well, that's going to change. 
with Axon, the chief and I were talking, we met with Representative Diggs uh, yesterday and we were talking about with Axon, their, their technology, it's uh, all Bluetooth uh, connected. So if one officer doesn't have their camera on and another officer draws their taser or their firearm, all the cameras that are within that Bluetooth range, they all turn on, whether the officer presses a button or not. So there's a lot of technology advance, uh, advantages to having cameras. And, uh, and I fully support the chief's position that we should all have them. And your question uh, originally, how many? It would be 61. It would be uh, every sworn officer on the police department would, would be uh, required to wear a camera and, uh, and start from the top and move all the way down. You mentioned um, Mashpee. What other towns on Cape? Mashpee right now is the only town that is doing a body camera uh, pilot program. Other towns have done, have had cruiser cameras. Nantucket's had cruiser cameras for a while. Uh, the town of uh, Brewster's had them for a while. But the, you know, the, the cruiser camera is good because it, cat, it catches the video within the car. But once an officer gets out of the car, uh, the issue that you deal with then is if they move away from the, the view of the camera, you're only getting video. Uh, there are some limitations with body cameras as well. Most of the cameras that the officers wear, they're mounted on the center of their chest. Uh, so, it's, uh, so it doesn't obscure uh, any of their other equipment. So the problem is um, if they raise their hands up, sometimes the image is blocked. It's also not three-dimensional. So you lose uh, you know, perspective of distance. Uh, so there are things, there are some uh, limitations to them, but uh, Axon seems to be the best camera program that's out there. It's the manufacturer of our tasers and uh, they have, they've had the foothold on that for a long time. Is this something that's like unique to the Cape that most, it seems like most of our facilities don't have cruiser cams or body cams, or is it pretty like still just something that's up and coming across all of Massachusetts? It's, it's an up and coming issue uh, or, or program in Massachusetts just because of the unions. In other parts of the country, um, you don't have the unions that you have here. So they just implement cameras and it's just a normal, it's a normal course of business. You get hired, you get handed a radio, uh, a sidearm, and then you get handed a camera. We don't have that here. Uh, so as the chief said, uh, the supervisors have agreed in their con their last contract to, to wear cameras, the patrol uh, didn't get there. So uh, that would be something that we would be working for in this, uh, in this next round. But there are not, there's not a lot of uh, communities in Massachusetts that have either uh, body cameras or uh, cruiser cameras and part of the reason is it's expensive regardless of the uh, the company that you go with the uh, the data storage and the maintenance on the items themselves is very expensive yeah i can add to that just a little bit um the public thinks we have them you know they, they already think we have everything that's out there that they see on tv but we don't and massachusetts is funny we're, we're so behind the times on cameras and some of is union issues but Here's the other trick of why it has been delayed so long in Massachusetts. We, the Mass Chiefs, have proposed legislation to change a flaw in the, the law that, that, that talks about secret recordings. So if you read the law as it stands, you can say if we're wearing a body cam, that can be interpreted as we're secretly recording people. And we put it into the legislature for, oh my God, it's got to be six, seven years. And they don't want to change that because the ACLU thinks that that should be in there. So it's like this crazy uh, back and forth uh, way that, hey, we're telling you, we need to change this because, and some departments are afraid to, to get them because they're afraid we'll get sued for having body cams. But I think what has happened is like with uh, videotaping, uh, with using phones to, to videotape in, the, in any public setting that, um, that's basically, you should be expected that you're gonna you're be in tape or recorded anywhere you go. With the amount of cameras that are out there by individuals, by stores, by whatever you, there is should a, an expectation you're in the public, you should be um, expected that you're being videotaped. So, so that's kind of washed away any of the legislation, but the law is still there. The other thing that has happened is the change in technology with the, the general public as you see, and it's, it's kind of been some positives about is as much as it can be uh, disturbing to a police officer. Um, anytime we get involved and it happens right here in this town, officers uh, being videotaped is the minute they're doing something is talking to someone on the side of the street, 
they have a uh, domestic violence. People get their cell phones out. There's six people videotaping a car stop, waiting to see what happens, trying to get the next YouTube. And then what happens, and this will, you talk to all the other chiefs, the, the same thing they'll tell you is that the person who is getting videotaped becomes emboldened and wants and, and kind of gets in the officer's face, causes a disruption, and it gets confrontational when it really shouldn't be. And we're the only ones without a camera. We're the only ones without a camera. So that's, that's another change. And particularly over the past year it has changed even more. There's more emboldened people that are ready to, to do whatever. There are, uh, there, are, there are elected officials who have showed up at car stops and started questioning the officer uh, while they're in the middle of uh, doing a car stop. Don't stop them, you can't do that. It's like, what, what are you doing? Just, just let us do our job, please. So. Um, we're a big proponent of them. So, uh, I have a question about funding these. Uh, is, are there any grant programs available that you're familiar with that would uh, fund these? And are we, are we applying to those? Uh, there, there have been little ones, but they, they wouldn't put a dent in what we're doing. Um, uh, the, there was a capital uh, piece put in the state budget with the last budget cycle. That included, I think it was five million dollars for purchasing of body cameras to be spread out across the state, just for the purchase of them. Um, but that that never went anywhere. Uh, it was then, and of course, it's like with COVID, a lot of things didn't go anywhere. So, the, and even when you talk about five million dollars spread amongst 365 or 16,000 police officers, it really gets diminished. Um, Ideally, what, what would really be nice, and it's not going to happen, um, is that if the state had a man, had mandated with the police reform bill that you have to have a body cam, that would have been great. And then the state took over the implementation of purchasing and managing the accounts. That would that's really what it should have done. Now we're left all doing it differently. Different policies. Some have them, don't have them. Um, that would have been ideal, but that didn't happen. Any further questions? Yeah, a follow-up, uh, Chief. With the um, funding of it, I, I seem to recall that it was in the capital budget, but withdrawn as a request or put off to FY22. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, we've kicked the can down the road several times because it's a big number. Um, and when you have cruises that need to be running, get people to the call for us, that they become a priority. You see the priority list, you're on the capital thing. There's everybody in the town, uh, I mean, has a laundry list of, of things that we, that are, that are have to have and nice to have. And, you know, the body cams where we should get them, but uh, we, we, the other priorities with the limited amount of fundings, we, we had to get those as well. Um, and then we did have a labor relations that we do have supervisors agreeing to body camps, not a big deal in the patrol. I, like I said, they will, they will fall through. They, as a matter of fact, one of the officers was asking if we can get them, you know, he's not speaking for the union, but he's asking if we could get them. And in some, uh, places across the country, the officers were buying their own. Uh, they feel that strongly about them. Uh, but yeah, just fair one, they are not perfect. They're like everything else. They are technology. How many times has your phone uh, phone jammed up or not worked properly or something? Uh, there is you know, functionality when you get in and out, the batteries die and all, all those types of things. So they're not perfect, but they are a great step forward that I think that is uh, meets the current environment in police and it should, it should be a have to have. Yeah, I, I would say uh, in addition to the, the cost benefit analysis that the deputy chief uh, did, um, there's also a, a larger benefit when you're talking about recruitment challenges and sort of the overall atmosphere and building and trust and, you know, getting trust to, the place, you know, the, I think that the, it really aids in that. So I would support that next year if you brought that up, you know, for the capital budget. Um, and I, I do have a, so I sent you, obviously you saw <laughs> several questions with not a lot of notice. So totally feel free to take your time on getting back to me over the, over email on those. Um, I did want to just ask as far as the overtime, um, last year, it looked like the, in FY20, 
the OT was twice as what is budgeted for this year. So I just wanted to, uh, on the actual. Um, so I wanted to just check and see how you are all are doing in terms of actual for FY21. Uh, I don't have the most recent report with me. Kevin, do you have that by chance? I don't, but my recollection is that we were we were uh, about 65% through the overtime budget and not through that part of the year. So we had uh, one supervisor that was out for about five months that created some issues for us. And, um, and then, you know, another officer that's been injured, but uh, we can definitely get where we sit right now. But we are, as you saw that slide, we are not on track for our overtime. We've, uh, we've spent more than, we're, than more than we're allocated. And that's also part because of the cut that we have that $50,000 cut, we're, we're factoring that into what we have to do uh, for the rest of the year when training comes. So we are forecasting where we think we're gonna be, where we're gonna land, and right now we're behind, but we can get you a definitive number. Great, thank you. We should have more info on that on Friday. We are meeting with the command staff to go specifically to talk about overtime. I've challenged the Lieutenant to say, hey, this is what we have. How are you gonna do it? So I'm putting a little responsibility on them because sometimes coming from the chief to be the idea man, to figure it out, I, I have ideas, but it's time for them to figure it out and be able to understand it and move on and make it work. Um, cause it is challenging. Cause we, we, like I said, we should, should not be um, cutting our police and fire during this particular time. Yeah. And I, I, I wouldn't know unless I saw some kind of analysis, but yeah. um, you know, is there any value in adding one or two more personnel um, to help, you know, bring that down overall? And I just don't know how the numbers add up in terms of like salary benefits, OPEB, um, if it if it ends up being of any value. But um, if, if there's such high OT, it would see, you know, I'd be curious also to know how much is training versus how much is um, just, you know, people are out yeah. sick. And, and it's just, to stretch too thin that would be something yeah we we have we have a lot of data but it fluctuates because it depends on a lot about what your staffing is who is in who's out who's retired how long does it take to get the replacement in um and that impacts training so one year training might cost you one hundred and fifty thousand, but if you get better staffing on the shifts the next year it might cost you 118,000 because it all depends. We pull people off the shifts uh, with the idea that we don't want to, we want to have minimum staffing on the shifts. But then if you go, but someone's out injured, sick, whatever it is, and they're, they're off the shift at the same time, then your costs go up. Um, but we have a lot of data that, you know, we'll have a lot more and I'll gladly, and you can call me anytime, Stephanie, come in or we'll show you what it did and what the challenges are. We know where every penny goes, um, so that, that's a good thing. Um, but sometimes you, you're trying to do everything you're supposed to do and you just don't have it. And we're, we're at that point and it's, um, so we're trying to be creative. Uh, we're at the point we may have to um, reduce our detective division, uh, which is not, not a positive thing because that, that goes into, all right, well, who's gonna do that? Um, we may have to move the pack offices and get them to do something else. Um, so it, it, there's, there's options, but from our perspective, none of them are good, but we want to be team players and, and make it work. But again, I think there are other options uh, if we can justify what we do and how we're doing it, that there are some fundings within the town. We'd like to have you explore and liberate some funding to get us through these tough years that we got ahead of us. Yeah, I think we just need to dig into the numbers and I would I would be happy to come there as soon as we all have the vaccine. Um, <laughs> That's one of your questions, right? In, in the meantime, um, maybe over email or, or Zoom. Yep. Thank you. And, and your vaccine question, I can answer that right now. I, um, what is happening? The county is receiving doses for public safety uh, sometime around the 11th, 12th. There's different plans for each section of the Cape. The uh, Upper Cape has a... Uh, a joint plan for uh, four towns in, in joint base Cape Cod. Bonstable Fire and Bonstable Police are doing their own uh, where they have four or five different fire departments and the police department are doing their own. Uh, 
and then Yarmouth has chosen through Bruce Murphy to do our own. We have about 150, 160 people that are going to be vaccinated that will be starting on the 14th for the first round. We have it staggered a bit so that, uh, you know, someone has reactions, you know, that we're not putting everybody out of work at the same time. Um, then there's a follow-up some within 30 days of the first shot. So that will be done. It, it, it will be here shortly. And we have about 85% of the department that will be getting vaccinated. It is not mandatory. Uh, it's hard to mandate that. Um, we have some people that can't take it because they've already had COVID within the last, uh, we have five employees that have had COVID. And so the, the suggestion is to wait uh, 90 days before they uh, they have it. Uh, fortunately, with the police and fire chiefs, we're, they weren't going to allow public safety dispatches to get vaccinated in this round. And we, we, we uh, made some noise about that because, like I said before, dispatches are unique. They, there are not a lot of them. And if they go down, the dispatch center goes down, um, we, we're going to be struggling to, to get dispatches in to do their job. Thank you. Just a quick follow up on Stephanie's overtime question. Mm -hmm. Just, I know it's impossible to like break it down exactly, but like what are the percentages with like, how much time is it like percentage of like the overtime is going to like training versus like court time and things like that. And so ballpark is completely good. Okay, I think uh, shift replacement for whether it's vacation time, holidays, sick, Shift replacement on patrol is the biggest proportion of our overtime. I, I'm going to guess, Kevin, you can correct me a lot. That is probably about 65% of where our overtime goes with both um, with supervisors. Uh, interesting enough, supervisor replacement um, takes up um, about for the t nine patrol sergeants that we have, those nine patrol sergeants eat up about one third of the overtime because of the fact that they are supervisors, only three assigned to a ship. When I mean three, that's not three every day. There's only um, two at the most that would be coming in at any one time. So when our staffing requires two, they have to, re when someone takes a day off, they have to be replaced. Uh, when they have to go to training, they have to be replaced. When they have to go to court, they have to be replaced. So that they eat up a lot of overtime. Now, Stephanie made a point about are there some other solutions? Yeah, you know, we may want to consider promoting from our existing staff a couple more sergeants, maybe two more, and put them on the shifts where where the overtime is being spent. Because uh, when you add one more position, uh, that's about 180 more shifts. So if you add two sergeants, that's 360 new patrol officer shifts that you're not, uh, sergeant shifts that, that theoretically could not be replaced on overtime. So you're gonna fill in a lot of gaps. The difference between a patrol officer and a supervisor is about 20%. Thank you. I have a, a question that's probably not specific uh, to the police department. And Ed, I think you probably need to answer this, but um, the chief had mentioned that uh, because some higher paid individuals have retired and are replaced by people who are in a pay grade, but the lower end of that pay grade. Is there some advantage across the town for us to fully fund every pay grade at the highest level? And then we always are raising the money, but uh, we return it uh, in free cash at the end of the year. Uh, one of the... Um items that we can control that we are low in the s p rating don't generate enough free cash that has been a policy of the town where we budget very closely and we do not um, over or pad our budget um, again that hurts us for 10 percent of our score with s p but that has just been a philosophy that we just don't overtax and pad our budget to um, accommodate for those situations. 
And like the police department, every department that has new staff where the salary goes down, they do not get to you know, increase their salary budget to reflect uh, the fact that you know, they've lost some money um, as it re relates to those types of changes. That's some of what we utilize to help try to balance the budget. Again, one of the things you have is, is a balanced budget, but we haven't heard from the schools yet. Uh, and that could change the ball game quite a bit um, versus uh, what you've already been presented. So, you know, we have typically had to uh, realize savings everywhere we can just to be able to balance the budget and not increase the tax rate to the point where we try to do overrides, which may or may not be a good uh, idea this year. And we've had several failed overrides as well because people um, in Yarmouth who have the lowest average incomes on the Cape, um, you know, want us to budget closely. Now, you know, that's just a fundamental shift. And again, I'd love to have more budget flexibility, but you know, that's just something that um, our selectmen and others have not allowed us to do at this point in time. Well, is it possible that to, I mean, in this interest rate environment, we can't argue that we're saving money on, you know, borrowing costs or anything of, of that nature, but in a time in which uh, maybe, you know, the spreads uh, are a little bit uh, wider uh, or e even the base rates are higher, um, it, it, I think we could make a sort of a, a cost benefit analysis argument that, uh, it may be to our benefit and we should try to convince the town of that. But I, I, I j just curious. Yeah, 30% of our rating is based on the economy. We borrow infrequently because we have so much of our capital within our levy. Whenever we've gone for re-rating, it's been a situation where the, con the economy was not very strong. So we have very strong management. We have very strong liquidity and contingent liabilities. Uh, budget flexibility, all of the numbers except for the institutional framework for the state of Massachusetts is strong and the economy as well as how much money we spend off on free cash. Other than that, we have, you know, very strong on all of the other ratings for the right. town. Right. So Thank it's really you. the economy that's going to put us over the edge. Do we have any further questions? Chief, Deputy Chief, I think we are all set. Thanks for that great presentation. We appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. If uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could ask the Deputy Chief to stay on, there's a transfer request uh, that's on the docket for tonight. Okay. Yes, I'm still here. And Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, if we could just, um, as a general policy, uh, I don't know, this is a question I guess for Dan, um, get the transfer request um, ahead of time before the meetings, I, I would really appreciate that. Dan, is that doable? That is doable, yes. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Dan, are we looking for Deputy Chief to explain? Yeah, this? just to explain what you're looking to do here. That's all. So as the chief had mentioned earlier with uh, the capital budget request for tasers, uh, when we first uh, went through this process uh, last year, we thought that we could use a, a five-year payment plan when we we're going to buy the tasers, which was going to space the payments out over five years instead of uh, two large payments. Uh, once we went through the, uh, the process uh, during one of the meetings, uh, Ed had pointed out that I needed to speak with Svetlana because uh, under Chapter 30B, you can only do three years unless you, uh, you put it before a, a majority vote at the town meeting. We didn't know, I didn't know that at the time when we had worked all the numbers out. So we went back uh, working with Svetlana. I went back to Taser and we were able to get a three-year quote, a three-year uh, contract price rather, using a, uh, a bid out of North Carolina, which is gonna save us about $9,600 over the course of the three years. So the, the amount of money that we had requested for the five years was uh, 21,760. That now needs to change 
to the 33,000 you see. So our request is to take uh, money out of the radio system upgrade. We'd, we'd receive $250,000 for that. The uh, pricing that we got uh, from Motorola has come in at about $218,000. So we have money to spare in that budget. So we'd like to transfer money from the radio system upgrade to the taser replacement and uh, sign the contracts. So we can buy the tasers. And then uh, the following two years, the cost would be uh, $33,066 per year. So uh, essentially we, uh, we were under an assumption that we could use a five-year payment plan. We can't. So we have to go to a three-year payment plan and we're getting uh, 200, uh, 2018 pricing on the tasers right now if we use this, uh, this plan. So we're requesting that transfer. Comments? So uh, just a quick question. We would need to uh, amend the figures in the uh, budget book for, um, next, for next fiscal year uh, to accommodate that, that it would be high, it would go from 21 to 33? Correct. Yeah, okay. For the next two years, Stephanie. So it would be uh, the next two years and then that would carry us through in this plan. Then there would be a, a two year gap and then we would request funding because we have to replace the tasers every five years. That's the warranty. But once a taser is out of warranty, because it's a, uh, a taser is a uh, sonically welded piece of plastic and there's only one moving part and that's the safety and that's plastic. Once it's out of warranty and it breaks, you send it back to taser and they give you a brand new taser for whatever the cost of it is right there. That's kind of a la carte. The handle is one price and then the cartridges are another and then the, the, the battery is another. So uh, when we buy our tasers, we do a five-year uh, warranty on them, which adds about $300, uh, $343 to the price of the taser, but it carries us throughout the life. Because if not, the taser is only warranted for one year. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Welcome. Chairman, uh, yes. just if Ed sent you just a minor point, if I may, uh, uh, Stephanie, uh, this is not part of the police department's operating budget. This is part of the capital, so we would not need to change the budget book. Just the minor point. Thank you, Ed. Just the capital. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions, or is there a motion? Motion to accept as submitted. Second. Okay. Do a roll call. Stephanie? Aye. Robert? Aye. George? Aye. Sarah? Aye. Nate? Aye. And I am an I as well. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this form is available for your signature. As you see, it is required um, after this vote tomorrow. at uh, the, in the town administrator's office. Uh, Mary Alice will have that for you. I've already spoken with her. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's move on to the next item on the agenda. Uh, new business, Dan, do we have any new business? No, I don't have any new business. Well, that's wonderful. Um, I think we can look for a motion to adjourn. I have a quick question for Dan. Okay. Um, how much longer can, do we, can we rely on you? When are you leaving? Uh, hard stop, January 22nd. Oh, well, we'll be sorry to see you go and thank you for your years okay. of service to Yarmouth. That's yeah, second that. Thank you, Dan. You're very welcome. 2022, right? <laughs> uh, right. right. <laughs> We'll just make a little switch in that uh, documentation, not a problem. And, and then just a technical question. In the meantime, should Pat, are we are we going to you with questions or I'm, I really haven't followed what's happening in terms yeah, of- Yeah, just to let everybody know, I was it was made uh, um, public known to me the other day that uh, Bob Lawton will be uh, assuming the role as interim yeah. uh, town administrator. So. I have a meeting scheduled with Bob on uh, next uh, Thursday to kind of go over transition planning. Um, so I, I would anticipate uh, Bob's level of effort apparently is going to be two days a week, but I, I would, my recommendation to him was going to be to um, continue to have Pat in this liaison role uh, to, to get through town meeting. She's carried it through this far. So. Okay. Thank you. And is there any, plan at this time to get uh, a, an assistant town administrator? Well, so that's a really good question. And uh, the way that would work would be that uh, they're going to need to fill the um, town administrator's position. And as soon as that's done, I'm sure Bob will be retained uh, to lead the uh, search for the assistant. That's how it was done four years ago when I was here. He did a great job. 
um, pretty much gathering up all the possible candidates, doing the pre-screen and selecting uh, five of them to be considered. So it's going to be a while, you know, and normally for these administrator positions, there's maybe up to a 90 or 120 day exit clause if you're going to take somebody from another community. So, you know, Bob will be on the job, I'm going to say probably for many, many months to come um, before you'll finally, unless whoever they select is somebody that presently doesn't have a contract obligation or is a free agent. So it could be a while. Okay. And the, before um, you're fully staffed. Yeah. And the, but and the budget for the town administrator's office is that um, the numbers are set uh, to um, when we were doing the planning uh, it's carrying my present salary and we scaled back uh, a little bit, the assistant town administrators position from uh, the past year, but it, there's enough money to cover it. So. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, best wishes in your new endeavors. Thank you. You're welcome. Brian, I have a quick question. I'm sorry. Um, what is our booking for the next few weeks for when we need to be available so we can calendar? That's a good question. And I was going to talk to Dan, hopefully uh, tomorrow about that. Uh, unless Dan, you want to. Well, I think uh, we're, we're, we're um, preparing the staff um, through Pat's efforts to be with you on Wednesday night. So we're, we're able to continue the schedule for this foreseeable future until we're done. So. So, uh, so should we book out all Wednesdays for the rest of the month? From six to eight, please. Um, next week, community services, which will be golf, senior services, library, uh, recreation and natural resources will be with you. And then on the 20th, uh, we have uh, community development, which is Karen Green and, and her crew. And then on the uh, 27th, uh, we have, uh, again, starting at six o'clock, DPW and inspectional services and so forth. Um, as, and so I can send you that list again. I thought we had sent it out, but definitely we six o'clock and we're preparing them to get their PowerPoints to us uh, the week previous. So you'll have the weekend at least to look at it before the meetings um, on Wednesday nights. Thanks, Pat. Do you have any Mondays or are we just, we're sticking to Wednesdays for the time being? I have all Wednesdays for you at this point. If the committee would like to change those dates, I can certainly make that available. Oh, no, I'm not suggesting that. I just wanted to know if we had to double up like we did last year. I, I don't believe so. Actually, my, my last meeting that I have uh, for you to uh, address finance issues is um, February 10th, I believe, which will be, uh, oh, no, no, it's the one before that. So February 3rd will be IT administration and finance. So after February 3rd, uh, you're free to reschedule it as you'd like. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Yeah, just remember, uh, keep in mind that um, end of February, I think it's February 28th by charter, um, recommendations have to be made to the Board of Selectmen. So we're trying to keep on a schedule to give you enough time to hear from the departments and then have some weeks to deliberate before you have to deliver that to the board. Absolutely. And in my absence that week of the 20th to the 28th, I know Ed will step up and take on the uh, Zoom mistress uh, position to uh, help you do that. Do we have a motion to adjourn if that's all we have for this evening? Motion to adjourn. Second. All right. Uh, you Stephanie? have to roll. Yeah. Oh, sorry. You have okay. to roll call, sir, just to remind. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Stephanie? Yes. Robert? Yes. Aye. George? Aye. Sarah? Aye. Nate? Aye. And myself, aye as well. I think that's it, folks. Thanks so much. Thanks, Brian. Thanks everyone. See you next Best week. Best of luck, everyone. And, and we'd love to see your smiling faces next time. I hope you choose to use your video. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye now.